Um, thanks. Welcome to those of you in the audience and those of you joining us from our online audience as well. Um, this has been a little bit unusual. We don't normally have to interrupt biotech because of weather, snow, and ice. Um, that sometimes is what happens when you have it in February, but thank you for sticking with us for an extra week that wasn't originally on your calendar. I appreciate it. Um, before we get started, let me um, just say a few brief words of thanks in case I run out of time at the end. Um, firstly, thanks to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming for four Tuesday nights. Those of you in our online audience, thank you for logging on for four Tuesday nights and asking questions and following through. Um, I, I appreciate it. This is the reason why we do these things. It's because you have interest and you ask great questions and you follow along and then you take this back and you incorporate it into your life. So thank you, both in this room and online. I also want to really make sure I thank the Jackson Center. This is such an incredible space for us to be able to meet session after session. Um, and Bob, you and your staff just do an incredible job. Thank you so much. Let me also say a special word of thanks to Keith Ward and the folks over at ETV. Keith's the one that allows us to actually put this online uh, and make it available for our online audience. And we'll actually take the videos, break them up into more manageable chunks, and put them on our website in the next few months. So if there's a part of this that you want to catch up on, you'll be able to come to the website and see that as well. So Keith, thank you very much for your efforts. I want to thank the volunteers that come and sit out front and give you handouts and give you your name tag with a smile. I so appreciate the work that they do, um, and I thank them for that. And I thank the members of the education outreach team that work with me, especially with this Biotech 201 session with so many moving parts. We have folks that have greeted and welcomed you at the door. We have folks that have monitored the online, that have been moderators and asked questions. So I just want to actually verbally express my thanks to Stacy Brewer and Brianna Ruhlman and Madeline Lofton, Daisy Price, Jennifer Carden, um, Adam Hott, Kelly East, and Michelle Morris, because without their efforts, we would not have been able to make this happen. So I, a special thanks to them. All right, now that it feels like we're at the Oscars, um, I'll stop um, giving words of thanks. Um, yes? Oh, the Jackson, who do we thank for the wonderful cookies? The Jackson Center provides those fantastic cookies. Aren't they great? They are wonderful. It, it's been a lot of fun. There have been, I've, I've followed the chat conversations online, and so at break time, while y'all all make the mad rush out to the cookies, um, there are polls on what people are eating at home. You know, what are, what are you eating at home? And, you know, some people have, you know, are having cookies. Some people have cake. Uh, we have a few people that said, you know, I'm having a, I'm sipping a nice glass of Chardonnay. Um, that will not happen at Biotech 201 if you come sit in the seats. We will not have Chardonnay and cheese in the, in the back. But it's been, it, it, it's been really fun to kind of keep up with those pieces as well. We have an enormous amount of ground to cover tonight in order to get everything accomplished. Uh, I have had so much fun putting this series together. There have been so many wonderful, amazing stories to tell. Uh, so here's where we've been for the last three weeks. We've talked about what is the microbiome. We've covered that background. We've talked about how the microbiome forms early in life and those early life experiences at birth and with food and with early exposures. We've talked about how the microbiome plays a role in impacting health and disease, and we've covered a surprisingly large list of different disorders uh, during weeks two and three uh, back here on the, on the screen. This week, we're going to talk about um, taming the microbiome. Uh, and what does it mean to try to actually cultivate or control those specific bacteria that are present in our guts? We're going to focus again most of our time on the gut microbiome. And we're going to talk about the impact of our diet, of probiotics, prebiotics, and of antibiotics. And we've actually covered these pieces in little ways multiple times throughout each one of the weeks. I've given you storylines about if you change this food product or if you add this probiotic or if you provide someone, uh, an animal with this antibiotic, we're going to summarize that. I'm going to give you some new bits of information and we're going to build from there um, to cover these pieces. However, I promised you that we would spend a little bit of time talking about microbiome as we age. 
and it's going to just be a very quick sampler. But let me start. Let me just, let's start with that tonight, and then we'll segue into taming the microbiome. I don't think you had this in your handout because I just put these slides together today. Um, so it, it, I, there's three slides that you won't have with you, so I apologize. So Keith, we'll need to make sure that uh, our folks watching it online get a good view of, of these slides. So multiple studies are now being done looking at the impact of the type of microbes that are present as individuals age. And in this picture, um, we've already talked about that as you move from a newborn to early childhood, as you build that gut microbiome, as that comes in, as you travel through the birth canal, or if you're born by cesarean section by skin impacts from the people that are, that are with you when you're born, as you begin to either take formula or breast milk, as you start to eat your first food, if you have those old friends, um, pets, or are exposed to, to some allergens early in life, that really shapes the microbiome. And for the first three years of life, there's a broad variety of what an infant and a toddler's microbiome looks like. But by about three years, those differences have settled into a relatively narrow range, and that three- or four-year-old's microbiome looks a lot like an adult's microbiome. But then, as we age, as we move past the age of 45, 50, 55, however you would like to define age, older age, I'm not about to do that, as you age, the diversity of bacteria that are present in your gut drops. Now, we've talked about diversity dropping in lots of other things as well. Things like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and in um, other gastrointestinal disorders. But as you age, there's a drop in the diversity, the number of different types of bacteria that are living in your gut. But the types of bacteria that disappear aren't consistent. I couldn't look at every 75, every 90-year-old and expect to see the same dropout. It varies greatly from person to person. So any two older individuals, their gut microbiome may differ from each other very wide, widely, much more so than any two, say, 35-year-old individuals' gut microbiomes would. So a group did a study relatively recently looking at gut microbiomes in older individuals. And they tried to determine if there was a correlation between the types of bacteria that were present and where these individuals lived. So they looked at individuals who lived in four different settings. And again, you remember my conversation from week one. Correlation does not equal causation. And I am painting with really, really broad brush strokes. And if there's ever a night where this applies, it's don't necessarily run out and try these things at home. Well, last week's fecal microbiota transplant also pretty much was don't try this at home either. But so they looked at individuals that are living out in the community, that are living in their homes or maybe in the home of a family member. They looked at individuals that are in day hospitals. So I would assume that that, based on what I could read, those are individuals that live at home but spend large parts of their day maybe in an adult center and then come back home at night. The third group was individuals that are in short-term hospital care, so they're spending up to two to three weeks in the hospital. And the fourth group was individuals that live in nursing homes. Now, let me be really careful and say there's a huge amount of variation from, people, from house to house and from nursing home and retirement center to nursing home and retirement center. So the things I'm about to say in no way apply to every nursing home or every retirement center. What they found was that the profiles of the older adults that were living in nursing homes and in short-term hospital stays had considerably less diversity than the older adults that were living at home or were spending their days in adult centers and then coming back to a home at night. Those individuals, the ones living at homes or in adult day centers, their microbiome was much more diverse and was much more like a younger adult's individual. But the individuals that were in hospitals or in nursing homes had much less diversity in their microbiome. And then they realized that this often is correlated when they looked at the diets of these individuals as well. And again, this is not every retirement center or nursing home, so please, I'm, not, I'm painting this with a very broad brush. But in many of those places, many of those nursing homes, the diets were high in fat, lots of starches, and low in fiber. 
And we've talked about this last week, that those high-fat, low-fiber diets are commonly found with, back, with a microbiome in the gut that has more bacteriodoides and fewer firmicutes. Fewer firmicutes. Now, here's the important note. Many times, individuals that are in the hospital or in nursing homes are there because there are other health issues that take them there. So you can't make this as a causation. It could very well be that they have different microbiomes and they are in poorer health, and because they're in poorer health, they're in the hospitals or in the nursing homes. You can't automatically say that they go in the nursing homes, their diets change, and their microbiomes become less diverse and their health declines. There are lots of other pieces at play here, but it's an intriguing finding that links them with some of the other things we've talked about with, with diet. So in an attempt to try to get a better handle on this, there are multiple studies. I'm only going to tell you about one that's in process right now. This is a study in Europe looking at um, about 1,250 older adults. And this is based on some work looking at centenarians, individuals that have lived to be 100 or more, and looking at some of their diets and their microbiomes. So for this study in Europe, half of these individuals, so 625, are going to keep their normal diet. That won't change. The other half are going to shift to the so-called Mediterranean diet, which is high in uh, fiber and grains, fruits and vegetables, olive oil and fish, those sorts of things. And at the end of the year, they're going to look to see if there's a difference in the microbiome of these individuals and if there's a difference in health. Now, right away, there are some potential problems with this because if you are 75 or 80, you may have health problems brewing that may not show up until you've been on the process of these diets but have nothing to do with these diets. A year on the diet may or may not make a difference. So there are some caveats they're going to have to work with. Regardless, there have been multiple studies that show that our microbiome decreases, the diversity decreases as we age. So anything that we can do to increase that diversity, eating broad ranges of foods that cultivate multiple different types of bacteria in our gut, early evidence suggests that that would be beneficial. But again, that's early evidence. So this is a great lead-in to our conversation on how we change or how the microbiome may or may not be changed. And there are some groups that talk about um, big domestications. So the first worldwide domestication was with crops, the agricultural revolution, where we learned to take crops growing in the wild and store the grain and only plant the seeds from the crops that we had found from the, from the wild grain that had lots of grain on the grain heads or it was easy to pull the grain off the grain heads. And, and so early crop domestication, and this map just shows you all the places around the world where things like apples and soybean and rye and sorghum were domesticated. A lot of people that work with the microbiome are now calling for a second big domestication, and that is learning how to control and how to tame and cultivate the microbes in our gut. If we can figure out the types of foods or the types of bacteria we need to bring in or the types of nutrients we need to bring in to cultivate the good bacteria and keep out the bad bacteria and keep things in balance, that's the idea of the, this second big domestication. We are not going to get there quickly. If anything, if you have seen anything from what we've talked about the last several weeks, the studies are early and they seem to conflict sometimes and there's a lot of difference. When you have thousands of different bacterial species living in your gut, being able to quickly say, oh, well, if you take that species and give that to that individual, that's going to change everything, that's not realistic. So recognize this is a long process, and if someone comes up to you tomorrow and says, take this, this will cure your microbiome and bring you back into balance, you need to do some serious work before you take that, whatever that is. So how do you change that microbiome? Early suggestions are, well, we talked a lot about early life influences, and then the four that we're going to talk about tonight, diet, probiotics, prebiotics, antibiotic exposure, and we're actually not going to talk about this much because we talked about this last week, that whole concept of microbial transplants. I intriguingly, let me jump back to the aging for a second. There are some individuals that are suggesting that we may want to look at um, fecal microbiota transplants from healthy 80-year-old donors to restore a healthy balance for individuals that are, that are 
older but are in um, microbiome problems. Not necessarily things like um, colitis and, um, and C. difficile, but if they don't have a lot of diversity, maybe they want the diversity that they would get from an, another donor. But you don't necessarily want the 30-year-old's microbiome because there are some things that shift as we get older that you wouldn't necessarily want in the gut of an 80-year-old. So you might want an 80-year-old who's healthy. So if you discover at some point down the road that you are a healthy, older individual, you've got good microbiome, you might consider offering your services. Um, <laughs> there are people on Craigslist right now that are selling, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, 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 I mean that. All right. This is an important point that I want to make and make sure that I make very, very clearly before we go any further tonight. Anybody know where this is? Any guesses? Ooh, y'all are good. I didn't even have to show you this. Oh, you, do you have the second clue? You don't have this in front of you, do you? Oh, good, good. So the second clue was the picture of the Matterhorn and the Swiss flag. But yes, so this is in Switzerland. And every September, about 350 cows come down from the pastures on the mountain where they've been grazing during the summer. This is around the village of St. Stephen. And these cows are adorned with flowers and ribbons and the farmers and the cow herds walk along with them. And people come from all around the world to see this procession of the cows. Now, Switzerland is my focus, not cows. But tonight my goal is to be neutral in my conversations with you about probiotics, prebiotics, and antibiotics. <laughs> I am not going to tell you, you need to go to Drugstore X and on that shelf you need to buy this product. I'm not going to tell you, you need to make sure you have this diet and that this food is not in your, this is, these are not in your pantries. We are early in the game. I'm going to show you the data. I'm going to caution you not to take what I've said and immediately apply that, but I am going to tell you we clearly understand that diet and probiotics and prebiotics are going to make a difference. I don't know that I'm at the point where I'm ready to tell you you should do something. In fact, I don't think I'll ever tell you you should do something. But keep an eye on this. Consider this. Have some conversations with your physician. See if these options might be useful do some research, do some digging before you make decisions about what you want or don't want. But you're not going to hear from me, everyone needs to rush out. I am not going to endorse a product. That's just not the way that we're going to approach this. Everybody all right with that? All right. Diet. But if you, if, if, if I what, if... I would love for you to tell me, I would love for you to tell me, recognizing again that an, an N of one, that one individual does not necessarily apply to everybody else. But I'd love you to tell me within reason. Um. <laughs> well, make it short and sweet, but I don't, need to, I don't need to know a whole lot about the fecal microbiome from your body. We'll just leave that at, at, at that point. I really, really like you, but even that might be crossing a line somewhere. So, all right, so we've talked a lot about diet. We've talked about the impact from comparing the diets of individuals in Italy, children in Italy, and children in Africa, Burkina Faso. We talked about this the very first week, and how their diet is very different, and their microbes in their gut are also very different. We also, the second week, talked about choline and carnitine and how that's what this image is here on the right, how those are metabolized by the body and how the bacteria in the gut turn those into TMA, TMA, which then the liver turns into TMAO, and if those are risk factors for atherosclerosis. And then last week, we talked about high-fat diets, especially as it relates to studies with mice and the impact of having a very high-fat diet and how that shifts the population of microbes. And I don't know if I actually said this part specifically, but your gut microbiome is relatively steady throughout adulthood in terms of you have lots of different types of bacteria present. The numbers of those bacteria, though, shifts dramatically based in part on what is in the environment where those bacteria live. 
So you may have 10,000 different kinds of bacteria, the vast majority of them present in very small numbers. And then if you change what you're eating, that may provide nutrients to some of those that are present in very small numbers and they bloom. In other words, they grow and they reproduce very rapidly and now they take up a much larger percentage. And then if you quit eating that, they go back down to smaller numbers. So I wanna make sure that you are not hearing that when we eat this food, we bring these bacteria in, but they weren't there before. In some small cases that might happen, but in many cases, these are already present in your gut. You're just either nourishing them and they're thriving or they're present at very, very low levels. So this is a study that I'm gonna tell you about that I find absolutely fascinating. And the punchline is this. His, until recently, we thought that it might take weeks and weeks of a diet before it began to change the, the numbers of your microbiome, that you would have to eat this food for a long time. This study that came out in Nature back in December says that's not necessarily the case. Again, it's one study. It's a relatively small number of people, so take that into account. But they took nine individuals and they had five days of a very, very animal-heavy diet and five days of a very plant-heavy diet. This is the way it worked. They did lots of measuring, and they did measurements for four days, and then the people had five days of this plant-based diet, and then they washed it out. They went back to their normal diet, and they were monitored for the entire window, the, the pre-diet, the five days of the diet, and the washout. And then they let a month go by, of the people eating whatever they wanted, and then they brought them back in and they measured them again for a series of baseline days. They were on the animal-based diet for five days and there was a washout. And along the way, let me back up a second. Nope, let me back up the wrong direction. What was really intriguing about this diet, I dug into the, um, the details of the diet. There we go. If you were on, when you were on the plant-based diet, you had lots and lots of, you had granola for breakfast, and you had all kinds of vegetables grilled or um, raw vegetables at lunch and at dinner, and you ate mango and papaya and bananas and pineapple all throughout the day, and you drank water. If you were on the animal diet, when, it was, when you then went on the five days of the animal diet, you started with two eggs and bacon and sausage and you had beef brisket at lunch and hamburger and you had steak and chicken at dinner and your snacks were things like pork rinds. <laughs> so, I mean, dramatically different, some of you are thinking that sounds really good, dramatically different diets during those five day windows of very, very heavy plant and very, very heavy animal based. And the question was, can those five days of those diets shift the microbiome, shift the bacteria that are living in your gut? There was a daily food log. All the foods during those five days were prepared by the scientific team and the nutritionists and then delivered to the nine subjects that were part of the study. And they were able to calculate based on portion sizes and how much, what the caloric intake was, what the fiber intake was, all of those pieces. So this image is really intriguing and it's, it's a little washed out. So I apologize for those of you that are in the room looking at this. Hopefully it's better for those of you that are online. But you can see the plant-based diet is here on the left. The animal-based diet's on the right. There's this really, really light band that runs down the middle. Those are the actual days of the diet itself. The baseline is on the left, and the washout days were on the right. And what I think you can see, if you look at the very first set of graphs, there's a huge difference, for example, in the amount of fiber. In the plant-based diet, you can see that the fiber values go way up, and the fiber values go way down on the animal-based diet. If you look at the amount of fat intake, the fiber diet, the fat drops, the animal diet, the fat goes way up. And then the bottom one, the protein intake. The protein drops when they're just eating plant material and the protein intake goes way up when they're eating the animal. So these are clearly very, very different diets during this five day window. They also collected stool samples and looked at the presence of the microbes that were, that were in the gut of these subjects during the baseline, the diet, and the washout window. 
And the bacterial diversity is the image that's here on the right hand side. And you can see with the plant and these, let me back up, these blue arrows, they um, added a dye to the very first thing the patients ate when they started the diet and the very last thing the patients ate when they ended the diet. And they asked the patients to notice when that dye came out in their stool to give them a sense of how rapidly or slowly the, this diet moved through their digestive system. Intriguingly, they found that it took an extra day and a half for the animal-based diet to make it through the digestive system compared to the plant diet. It moved much, much more slowly. There's a lot less fiber in there, so that's part of it, but it was, it was held on in the intestines, the, the large intestine, for a longer period of time. So that's what the blue arrows are, when the dye, on average, was reported. Um, so this is when it enters into the, when it's present in the microbiome. And you can see that the bacterial diversity of the plant-based diet, it, you know, it, it doesn't change very much. This is about the amount of diversity that's present in the, in the microbes, in the gut beforehand. But there's a huge increase in diversity for the individuals when they ate the animal-based diet. So suddenly, bacteria that were present at relatively low levels are now present in very large amounts, large enough that now they can be measured. Before, there were too few of them to be detected by the system. Now, because of the kind of food that's coming through the system, they are growing and they're dividing and they are happy campers and they're able to be picked up in the bacterial analysis. This is an incredibly busy slide. <laughs> yeah, it's a really busy slide. Here's the punchline. They're looking to see if there were certain types of bacteria that shifted in their frequency on the plant diet or shifted in their frequency on the animal diet. If there was no shift at all before and during diet, then it would show up right in the center of this plot of zero and zero. This is the axis along the bottom for the plant-based diet, the x-axis, and the y-axis is the change once they actually were on the animal-based diet. So in other words, if a specific type of bacteria didn't change at all on the plant-based diet, but changed dramatically on the animal-based diet, on the x-axis, it would stay around zero, but the y-axis would shift up and down. In the same way, if it changed a lot on the plant diet, then you would see the x-axis axis shifting. So what you can see is that there's not a whole lot of shifting back and forth on the x-axis, but there's a lot of shifting on the y-axis, which essentially means that the types of bacteria varied um, in terms of their numbers greatly when you went on the plant-based diet. There were 22 clusters significantly changed on the, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. 22 clusters significantly changed on the animal diet only three clusters significantly changed when they went on this plant diet. And one that you'll remember is our friend here at the bottom in cluster 29, so right below the graph, the um, acromantia. That's the bacteria that lives in the mucus, that loves the mucus that we talked about that was present like 3,000 times less in the mice that were overweight that we talked about last week. Mark. Yeah, that's a great question. Has anybody looked at the impact of cooking on your access to bacteria? There are a lot of theories that cooking the meat did two things. One, it decreased the number of live bacteria that we brought in, but the process of cooking made the nutrients more accessible to humans. So while cooking decreased the amount we could bring in, Although I suppose if the meat fell in the dirt and then you ate it, you would pick that back up again. But the very act of cooking and softening the meat made more nutrients available for humans to take in. If you put someone on a purely plant-based diet that only eats uh, live, mm, I guess live, that only eats uh, um, ground up seeds or uh, only eats vegetables, you have to take in a lot more calories to get nutrition than when you go to meat and when you be raw food diet, that's what I'm trying to say. A raw food diet is very difficult to get nutrients out of compared to a cooked diet. Now here's a really cool side story and I wasn't going to tell this but you asked so now we're going to tell this story. A group of researchers were studying seaweed. 
And seaweed has a certain really complex carbohydrate in it that most organisms don't know how to digest. Um, they, a very small number of marine bacteria um, have an enzyme poifrinase that allows them to break down the nutrients that are in seaweed. They did a search to see what other types of bacteria also had these, the genes for these enzymes to break down seaweed, and they found six different bacteria, five of which are common in marine ecosystems in the ocean, and one of which, which lives in the guts of humans. But that one that lives in the guts of humans is only found in individuals of Asian, primarily Japanese, descent. And they figured that the connection, they worked this through, the connection is that this bacteria often, this marine bacteria, often lives on the seaweed. And until recently, in Asia, large amounts of raw seaweed were consumed. Now, if you go buy sushi right now, it's been sterilized and the seaweed's been cooked and that bacteria has all been killed. But until recently, if you ate seaweed, you were ingesting some of those marine bacteria. And in the gut, something called lateral gene transfer happened. The bacteria from the ocean transferred the gene for digesting the seaweed into the bacteria that lived in our gut. And our gut now gained the ability to extract nutrients from the seaweed. As long as you were continuing to take in raw seaweed, this bacteria was continuing to thrive. If you looked at the guts of people who were not from Japan, who did not normally eat sushi, none of them have that specific gene in that gut bacteria. It only came in on the people that were eating raw seaweed. They ate the bacteria. The gene got transferred from the bacteria into their own gut. Really amazing transfer of genes back and forth in bacteria. That was way far afield from what you originally asked, but it was a cool story, so I wanted to share it. So thank you. <laughs> Yeah, the gene was actually, so bacteria had this really interesting way of interacting with each other and making small bridges between them so the contents of one cell can pass into the contents of another. Um, normally this happens, and my, um, my monitors uh, do some correcting of me if I'm wrong. So Adam, this is your area of expertise here, not mine. But as bacteria, sometimes bacteria can transfer their genetic information from one bacterial cell to another. And so it actually transferred part of the DNA that included this gene and then incorporated it into this other strain of bacteria's own DNA. Yeah. Bland versus, is there a difference in the gut microbes of individuals that eat very spicy diets and the individuals that eat very bland diets? I don't know. That's a really good question. I'm thinking like wasabi with sushi or something like that. Or, or um, heavily spiced Indian or certain African dishes compared to many of us who like things nice and bland, uh, like mashed potatoes and rice. <laughs> That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that question. Let me see if we've got any questions from our online audience as well. Nope. All right. So let's move on. So what this study tells us, this really intriguing study, tells us that the microbes in your gut can very rapidly shift as your diet changes. That within a small, within five days, you can have this bloom or this fading of certain gut bacteria. And this actually makes a lot of sense if you think about our ancestors in a hunter-gatherer society that they lived in a world where animal proteins probably were very rare, but when they, when they captured the buffalo, bison, mastodon, whatever, that there was an enormous amount of meat, and that was the primary component of their diet for many, many days. But that could disappear, and they could go weeks or months without any animal protein, and then they had to rely on the plants that they would forage as their backup source of calories. So they had to have a gut microbe, a gut um, ecosystem that could very quickly shift to break down the proteins found primarily in plants, the nutrients found in plants, or the nutrients found primarily in animal, um, animal products. So it had to be able to make this shift back and forth. 
really interesting study. A lot of people stood up and took notice when this came out because his, until now, they thought, oh, you had to be on diets for months. You had to be vegetarian for months before you began to shift the microbiome. Mm, maybe not so. I love this. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, this is a group that I follow. This is the Human Food Project, and you can see they're linked to the American Gut Project that we talked about last week. That's the group that for $100 you send in a sample and they tell you what's in your gut. So this individual, um, his name is Jeff Leach. He wrote this story about going, about his one-year journey to get the healthiest gut microbiome. And this is a little bit of it. And, and I apologize for reading to you, but that's exactly what I'm going to do. Throughout 2014, I'll undertake a series of dramatic shifts in my diet and lifestyle in an attempt to whack my microbiome around. For example, aside from the high-fat, high-protein diet I just finished at the first of this year, I will go on a raw food diet for a few weeks, followed by a juicing diet, possibly followed by a vegan diet, followed by an Atkins-like diet, followed by a Mediterranean diet, followed by a period of fasting, possibly a week of lots of fermented foods, followed by a paleo diet, followed by Jenny Craig and Weight Watchers diets, followed by a master cleanse diet, and so forth, repeating some diets several times. He also then goes on to say, I will also probably have weeks where I consume large amounts of alcohol. <laughs> so, as he goes through all these diets, again, this is not, try this at home. Do not try this at home. As he goes through all these diets, he's going to continue to send in samples of his gut microbiome and see how they change. Now, again, this is a study of one individual, but it's going to be really interesting to follow this and to see how this shifts because there are major differences between a raw food diet and a paleo diet and Jenny Craig. So it'll be intriguing to see what kind of data come out of this. So if you're interested in following along, the Amer you can just uh, type in your favorite search engine, the Human Food Project, and you'll get this kind of information and we'll see what happens. Jim, you had a question. So did he climb the Matterhorn? Did he climb the Matterhorn? I have no clue. But I do know he does a lot of work with hunter-gatherer tribes in Africa. And so he will multiple times throughout the year go spend several weeks with them and completely shift his diet there as well. Quite a bit of change. Quite a bit of change. Quite a bit of change. It would be interesting to see if he also takes samples of his blood and if he's looking at specific metabolic profiles along the way as well. Not just to see if his gut microbes change, but what is potentially being put into his bloodstream, like his lipid profile, his cholesterol profile, his amino acid profile, if that shifts also. Oh, Adam um, reminded me that there's only a certain phase of growth when bacteria transfer information back and forth. Um, so, uh, and there, it's done through small molecules called plasmids that sometimes drag some of the DNA from the rest of the, the genome along with them. So thanks, Adam. All right, now we're going to shift. So now let's talk about probiotics. Again, Switzerland, neutral. Probiotics, the meaning of the word, is literally for life. And the World Health Organization defines probiotics in the following way. These are live microorganisms which, when administered in adequate amounts, that is a really key phrase, adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. So there are, some, there are things that have to happen in order for something to be classified as a probiotic. First of all, it has to be a live microbial organism. Dead bacteria are not probiotics. They have to be living. This is important because if you take yogurt because of the beneficial bacteria and your yogurt's been sterilized, your bacteria in the yogurt are dead. They are not probiotics. They're just debris that's working its way through your digestive system. <laughs> live culture. They need to be capable of surviving the digestive process so they get to your intestine alive. Many of the bacteria that we take as probiotics or that we think are beneficial um, are destroyed by the enzymes in our stomach or in your small intestine and never even make it to your gut. Or they just pass right on through. So there's no long-term benefit. 
And then they need to be able to induce some response in the host organism that's beneficial. So they have to hang around long enough. They have to be able to displace harmful bacteria, or they have to produce some protein or some bioactive molecule that actually is valuable to you. If they don't do any one of those three, if they don't do all of those, they're not probiotics. Now, this is an amazing story. This is um, Eli Mechnikov, who um, lived uh, 1845 to 1916. Um, he was a Russian biologist. He's got an incredible story. Google this guy at some point. Um, he was in Odessa. He worked as a, as a faculty member. He ultimately went to Paris at the Pasteur Institute, which was founded by Louis Pasteur, and he succeeded Louis Pasteur as the head. He won the Nobel Prize in 1908. Incredible guy. In the later years of his scientific career, he began studying health and longevity, and he noticed a group of Bulgarian peasants who were living almost or past the age of 100, but they lived in very modest circumstances, very little food, not a lot of opulence, and he put together a list of things that sounds quite reasonable to you and I. Moderate amounts of food, moderate amounts of fat, moderate amounts of alcohol, lots of fresh air, lots of exercise that he felt were key to long life. Before we really understood what bacteria were and that there were bacteria inside of us, he felt that there was something, he called it putrefying substances that lived in our gut. At that time, the the current thinking was that the gut was the cesspool of your body. It was just, I mean, there were lots of people during this time frame that were just routinely taking people's colons out because they thought that would make them healthier. He did not take people's colons out, but he advocated that in order to turn the tide against these putrefying substances, you needed to drink sour or fermented milk. Now, what is that? Yogurt. He advocated that you should take yogurt every day and that there would be beneficial byproducts of what was in that soured product. So this is really, this was incredibly popular during this time frame. Lots of people were, were taking yogurt and then it kind of fell out of favor. And it stayed out of favor until really like the late 70s, early 80s when this understanding of probiotics began to resurface. So he was way ahead of his time. And is really the father of this entire piece. This book actually exists. Again, I am not telling you to go and buy this. Neutral, Switzerland. But the potential modes of action for these probiotics Direct competition with the bad bacteria, so they crowd them out, they create an environment. This is kind of like when you um, overseed your yard intentionally so that there's so much grass that comes up that it crowds out the weeds, that the weeds can't get a, can't, uh, make, get a choke or they can't uh, get a stepping stone in. It may be that probiotics produce beneficial byproducts, um, proteins or enzymes or other molecules that are valuable or useful. And here, now we're coming back to leaky gut. This is the third time that we've talked about leaky gut, intestinal permeability. If you can make sure that the cells in your intestine are tightly joined together so the contents of the gut don't spill out into the body, that's a good thing. Probiotics are thought to help improve intestinal permeability. Probiotics do all of these different things. And the way you take them, you can take them orally, as supplements, as pills, mixing it in with liquids, intranasally, nasal sprays that then make their way into your system, or colonic. And we're not going to go down that road, but that's another way that you can get them into your body. We've already talked about potential probiotics in many of our previous week's conversations. We talked about how certain strains of lactobacillus reduced anxiety in mice, uh, lactobacillus and bifidobacteria reduced anxiety in humans. We talked about this bacterioides and the role that they may play, at least in mice, in helping alleviate some of the autism-like symptoms. But I made you, I was really cautious to say that's in mice, that's in one type, of, one form of potential autism. And then we talked uh, last week about this, this um, mucus-loving bacteria down here at the bottom that was reducing obesity and metabolic disease in mice. So that's the background that we've already covered. Here are some additional findings. 
I went to the Cochrane Summaries, which the web link for this is down here in the lower right-hand corner. Um, they're a pretty respected group that gathers multiple bits of data together and assesses them and says, how much evidence is there for this belief? What, is this, what, are, the evidence, what are the papers say? What are, they, they kind of do summaries of scientific papers. And there's pretty good evidence that probiotics provide additional benefits for um, in pediatric populations for diarrhea associated with antibiotics, for necrotizing enterocolitis in preterm infants. This is, a back, this is an infection, a bacterial infection that um, damages or destroys the guts of newborn infants, especially infants that are born prematurely. There's some pretty strong evidence that certain kinds of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium given as probiotics can blunt the impact or reduce the severity of um, necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, upper respiratory infections. I found that really interesting. Irritable bowel syndrome, um, certain forms of allergies, and then ulcerative colitis. Now again, this is the data that's been published. In many cases, it's a single strain of probiotic, a single strain of bacteria that's given. But in some cases, you'll see things like this group, VSL number three. VSL number three is a blend of eight strains of different bacteria. So it's four lactobacillus, it's three bifidobacteria, and it's one streptococcus. You can get this um, depending on the dosage strength in pill form, in a powder form that you mix in with liquids. You can buy it over the counter, you can buy it online. If you want the super strength, you have to have a prescription for it. But it is one of the more popular and widely available probiotics. But if you walk into your drugstore or your grocery store, you're going to find almost a shelf full of probiotics. It is very, very overwhelming to try to figure out what's in those and how does that match with, with what current research says. Again, I'm not endorsing VSL number three. I'm just intrigued by the fact that it is a blend instead of a single probiotic that many of the research studies have looked at. And there's good evidence on the previous slide that it offers some benefit in some of those instances. There was a question in the back of the room. Is it true that probiotics are not good unless they're refrigerated because it's supposed to be a lot of bacteria? Is it true that probiotics are not good unless they're refrigerated? Um, there is certainly evidence that if probiotics, if, if, if they're allowed to get hot, under certain conditions that it can reduce the activity of the bacteria, because they are live bacteria. Um, I have seen some probiotics that require refrigeration, and I've seen other probiotics that actually state that they are stable at room temperature. So I think it depends on the preparation, on how they're put together. Yes, ma'am. Does using a microwave destroy the beneficial ability of the probiotics? My guess, guess, is the answer is yes, because it is killing those bacteria. And you want them to be alive by the time they get into your system. Now, let's be really careful here. We want to distinguish between the bacteria that are good and the bacteria that you need to kill by sterilization, like certain forms of salmonella, for example. But my guess, and maybe my moderators can do some searching on this, is that if you microwave them, that you will kill the bacteria and you'll destroy their effectiveness. Uh, so far, no luck on the spicy food diet question. So let me see what we can find on that. Um, oh, here's a question from someone online. Um, does Neil keep kefir, which is a fermented um, milk product, or yogurt in his fridge for his kids? I wonder if my parents ask that question, because they're watching online. Uh, um, there is yogurt in the refrigerator for my kids. Uh, I actually am paying a whole lot more attention to probiotics now because I've gone through this study. I haven't started giving any to my kids yet, because I want to do some more research to figure out what I might give to my kids and to my wife and I. So at the moment, um, there are no uh, intentional probiotics in there. Um, if you ask me that in about six months, I might give you a different answer. So we'll see. So, uh, buttermilk has always been considered a good choice, but I just started thinking about it while I'm sitting here. If that's been pasteurized, it's not much worth 
the, yeah, so the question is about buttermilk that, you know, is historically, you know, buttermilk was a, was a digestive aid or, um, but if it's been pasteurized, what's the impact? If it's been pasteurized, the vast majority of those bacteria have been killed. There are probably a small number of bacteria. In fact, there have been studies done that there's some residual bacteria. That's why all milk, if it sits long enough, even pasteurized, goes bad. Uh, raw milk has all those bacteria, and there's a raw milk movement of people that feel that it's very beneficial to drink raw milk. Uh, there are some pros to that, and there are also some challenges because it's possible that you could have things in the milk that you don't want into your system. It's, it's part of this, this entire big debate. All right, so no benefit yet, and I'm about to get, send you for your break, no benefit yet for probiotics for Crohn's disease, eczema, preterm labor, and hypertension. So the Cochrane study, looking at multiple analysis, hasn't yet found anything. There are lots of other things that people are looking at probiotics for. We're going to talk about digestive health in just a little bit after the break. Um, but one of the big problems with many of these probiotic studies is that they are hampered by the huge placebo effect. For those of you that, that might not be familiar with the placebo effect, the placebo effect is when you think you are taking something that is beneficial, and so therefore you feel better. The body has this amazing ability to feel better because it thinks it should feel better. So you can give individuals a sugar pill because they're on the control part of a project where they're not getting the medicine and their symptoms will improve. So if you tell someone, we're doing a study looking at probiotics, many of them will become convinced that the probiotic is beneficial and they will report huge increases in, symptom, in, in reduction of symptoms. This is really problematic when all those people are not taking any probiotics. And because we have bought into the idea that probiotics are beneficial, we expect, oh, I must be taking the probiotic, I feel better. So that's a big challenge in trying to really determine if probiotics are beneficial. They're, the study is muddied by the placebo effect. Okay, when we come back, we are going to talk about probiotics in fermented foods. All right, let's come on back together. So we're going to continue our discussion on probiotics. And we're going to talk about the probiotics that are present in fermented food. So we've talked about... All right, I'll give him a chance in just a second. It looks like he's in conversation right now. Um, we've talked about probiotics that you can buy that are live bacteria. Another great source of probiotics is from fermented foods. So these are things that are allowed to naturally ferment and there are microbes that carry out this fermentation. Traditionally, much of our early diet consisted of fermented foods. Sauerkrauts, for example, um, pickles, many of these things that are allowed to ferment and the microbes that make that process happen. Yogurt, uh, kefir, which is a fermented milk drink, sauerkraut, cabbage, um, cabbage, kimchi, and then soybean-based products, soybean-based miso, like miso soup. Um, these are all naturally fermented, and a number of individuals are big proponents of eating more fermented food as a way to bring more beneficial bacteria into your gut. Uh, cheese is fermented. Some types of cheese are fermented um, with specific uh, molds um, or bacteria. So cheeses also would fall in this, um, but I don't know the specific makeup of the bacteria and, and how they would compare to these. Good question, though. I, cheeses were heavy on that plant diet that I was telling you about. I mean, the, the animal diet where they ate the pork cracklins for snacks. Um, every dinner included a cheese plate with multiple kinds of cheese on it. So fermented foods, you might consider adding fermented foods to your diet if you're looking for ways to increase your probiotics, which brings us to yogurt. Um, specifically, I had lots of people ask if I was going to talk about Activia yogurt, um, which makes, you know, their, their catch line, their tag phrase is it, you know, makes your tummy happy. 
all yogurts are made with two, with at least two bacteria that help ferment the milk, um, that add the tang, you know, that, that characteristic tang. Um, one of them is a lactobacillus, and I think the other, uh, I'm forgetting what the other bacteria is. That's m almost all yogurts. If they're live culture yogurt, they'll have a lactobacillus, and they'll have this other bacteria with it as well. Activia goes one step further, and they say Activia is the only yogurt with the exclusive probiotic Bifidus regularis. Now, Bifidus regularis, if you dig your way through the fine print, is the marketing name of the bacteria. It's a bifidobacterium uh, that is added in. It's not present in other types of yogurt. It's a trademarked bacteria. And they've done some studies looking at the impact of this bacteria on uh, gastrointestinal issues that deal with rumbling and gassiness and transit time of food through the intestine and issues of constipation and diarrhea and those sorts of things. And their studies find that individuals that consume Activia multiple times a day for multiple weeks experience a decrease in symptoms. Um, I talked to you about the placebo effect. I'm not saying that that's the issue here, but it is something that has to be considered when people know that they are taking something that is supposed to make them feel better. Um, they certainly uh, have quite an impressive um, storyline and marketing process for for Activia. If you take Activia and Activia works for you, I am not telling you to stop act taking Activia, so hear me. I'm just saying Activia is a probiotic. It adds an additional bacteria that's not found in most other types of yogurt, and that they believe that that helps break down, um, that that helps, that that is a benefit to gastrointestinal distress. Probiotics are a big business. $24 billion in 2011. Just in the last couple of weeks, they now have announced probiotic coffees, and yes, they are available in a K-cup for your Keurig. <laughs> Pop that in and drink your way to better gut health. Um, I'm intrigued. I don't know what the bacteria are in these K-cups, in this probiotic coffee, um, but it's interesting. Did I just lose my mic? Boop. Let's see if I can fix that. Better? Good, okay. Uh, you can buy Great Grains cereal that now has active cultures in the cereal. Uh, probiotics are now finding their way into more and more consumer foods. So we expect to see them because consumers are demanding or are looking for ways to bring that in. Mark. Neil, did they explain how the coffee probiotics are supposed to survive the extremely hot temperature? <laughs> yeah, how, how, does, how do the probiotics survive the boiling temperature? Well, for example, if you, if I, like my K-cup, my Keurig is programmed, it won't go higher than 192 degrees. So it isn't boiling. So if they have found a way to encapsulate the bacteria, and I would imagine what they've done is they've coated the bacteria with something that helps them withstand heat and helps them make their way through the digestive system. I, I would hope so. Otherwise, you're just drinking dead bacteria. So I would think that they have figured out, I, I didn't read through the fine print, um, except that I think that says 500 million to 1 billion per serving. Long shelf life, no refrigeration needed. Um, I don't know, it'd be interesting to go back and look at that. But you're right, if they didn't take that into account, then they may be live when, the, when you put it into your cake, your Keurig machine, but by the time it shows up in your cup, it's dead. So they've got to, you've got to pay attention to that. Oh, oh wow. Um, is beer a probiotic? <laughs> Um, one of my moderators, um, Adam, you may be better able to answer this question than I can. Um, 
Is beer a probiotic? Well, there certainly is a fermentation process, and there certainly is yeast being added, and yeast is being looked at as a probiotic in some circumstances. Uh, I don't know if it's a probiotic because I don't know if the yeast survived the transit through the digestive system, and if they confer some, boy, you're going to disagree with me, some of you, some beneficial, uh, something of benefit to the host. Um, some of you will immediately say, yes, they do confer, but that would not be the bacteria, the yeast themselves. I don't know. That's a really good question. Um, maybe, maybe my um, moderators can figure that one out and get back to me, but that's a great question from our online audience. Let me give you two notes of caution before we go to probiotics. Oh my gosh, we got to move fast. Um, probiotics. Be careful because right now there's not a lot of regulatory oversight. So it's really up to each individual maker and manufacturer to guarantee that what's in the packet is what they tell you and that there isn't stuff in the packet that you don't want. So you want to be very careful about what you're putting in your mouth. And then the other piece I've talked a lot about lactobacillus, lactobacillus rhamnus, and lactobacillus helvetica. Because I've given you those names, you can't assume that every lactobacillus is going to confer the same kind of impact. So just because I've talked about one specific group, you can't infer that that's going to hold true for others. So if you go to look in the probiotic aisle and you see lactobacillus, and you go, oh, we talked about lactobacillus in Biotech 201, I'm sure this will be fine. You can't guarantee that. You've got to make sure that it's the exact same kind as whatever study you're reading. And even then, there may be slight differences from substrain to substrain that may make that difficult. So be careful. Again, I think I said somebody to this, I said this to somebody in the break. I think probiotics are going to be incredibly beneficial to us, and they're going to be a huge part of domesticating our microbiome. In some cases, I think we're there, and if you're on a probiotic that works for you, then I'm, I'm glad because you found one that works. But it's a little bit of a wild, wild west right now. That doesn't mean it won't, law and order won't be established, but just beware, just be careful. Okay, I think this now brings us to prebiotics. We talked a little bit about the definition of what a prebiotic is. A prebiotic is not a live bacteria. It's not a dead bacteria. It is some nutritional source that creates an environment that lets bacteria, good bacteria, beneficial bacteria, grow and thrive. So non-digestible food ingredients. Although not all dietary fibers are prebiotics, all prebiotics are dietary fibers. So a prebiotic is something that you take in that, is, that makes its way to your gut, and in your gut, your microbes use it as a food source. Examples include the fibers in bananas, onions, garlics, leeks, asparagus, artichokes, especially Jerusalem artichokes, soybeans, oatmeal, and whole wheat food. All of these are rich in the type of fiber that your body can use as a prebiotic. We talked about this already, what we've already covered. We talked about how dietary fibers can be digested by the bacteria in your colon and they produce butyrate and butyrate actually can help kill cancer-causing cells. So that was our example, I think, from maybe two, maybe last week, about, uh, about an example of a prebiotic. The specific fibers for these are called inulins, I-N-U-L-I-N. I'll show you that word again in just a second. The inulin fibers are taken up by the bacteria in your gut. The butyrate is then taken up by your colon cells that use it as a food source but they also can kill cancer cells because the cancer cells switch to using glucose as a food source and the butyrate builds up. Let's talk about the location of fermentation. So if you think about your gut, your small intestine empties into your large intestine right here in the cecum and it travels up the ascending colon, across the transverse colon, part of the colon, down the descending in the sigmoid and then into the rectum where it's ultimately held until it's expelled. The inulins and similar types of, of pro prebiotics are fermented primarily in this part, in the ascending part of the colon. That's fantastic. That's really beneficial, but that provides no nutrients to the rest of your colon. They're, the prebiotics are digested by the time that bulk makes its way through the rest of your colon. So there are other types of prebiotics. 
specifically wheat-derived arabinoxylin oligosaccharides. That just rolls right off the tongue. They are prebiotics that come from wheat. They are not digested, fermented by the bacteria that are present in this part of the colon, but the bacteria that are present in the transverse colon. So they provide beneficial nutrients to a totally different gut bacterial population. So far, I have not seen anything that specifically says that there are bacteria that are nourished by certain types of prebiotics in the descending colon. I, I, but, but it's intriguing that certain prebiotics are digested and beneficial in different parts of the colon. All right, here's a note of caution. We know a whole lot less about prebiotics than we do about probiotics, other than dietary fibers and, and their usefulness. And we've studied them primarily in individuals that are healthy. So we're looking at the benefit of a prebiotic to someone that is healthy. When we apply those studies to individuals that have disorders, especially gut disorders, we're finding that it is not conferring the same benefit as it is to healthy individuals. So a number of studies show that inulin doesn't increase bacterial numbers. It doesn't have any benefit either for individuals that are tube fed or that have Crohn's disease. And in fact, in some cases of Crohn's disease, the prebiotic is actually harmful. So again, you want to be careful. This is not just a, let's go out and take this right now and everything's going to be fine. All right, unfortunately, that's all I can tell you about prebiotics. We don't have a whole lot. When we circle back around to this topic in a few years, I would imagine that they'll, we'll spend a whole week probably on prebiotics. All right, I have 10 minutes, and I want to talk about antibiotics. Uh, so let me work through this as quickly but as um, clearly as possible. Many of the experiments that we have talked about that have looked at the impact of gut bacteria have given laboratory animals antibiotics, broad-spectrum antibiotics, to wipe out the bacterial population, and then, for example, they saw, oh, look, the risk of cardiovascular disease went down. Or, oh, look, the risk of obesity went down. So it's a logical question to then say, well, why don't we just all be taking antibiotics? That seems to do the trick. Let's just wipe out that gut population. That is a really bad idea because of two things. One, if you are continually taking antibiotics, you're increasing the risk of antibiotic resistance, resistant bacteria to form. So just to take antibiotics all the time is not something that you want to do because of the antibiotic resistance issue. Secondly, antibiotics are not targeted to only destroy one type of bacteria. Most antibiotics don't do that. So you wipe out a whole lot of beneficial bacteria at the same time. That's not something that you want to be doing to your digestive system, to your gut. So if you have a cold or the flu, antibiotics are not going to help you. Don't go in asking for antibiotics. Give yourself some time to see if you recover from this on your own. Be careful. Let me show you this. This is a study in one adult, and again, correlation. This individual took a seven-day course of antibiotics, and uh, this was the, the antibiotic that they took, clindamycin, and they're looking, what I'm going to show you is looking at one specific type of, bacteri of, of bacterioids, one type of bacteria. This is not the whole population of their gut. It's one specific group of bacteria. The more the colors, the more the diversity of the different types of this group of bacteria. You can see here, seven days after starting the antibiotic, we've only got one type of bacteria within this subgroup that we're looking at. There are lots of other bacteria present, but we've lost all this diversity. And we keep only this one type nine months out. Twelve months out, we start to build back this diversity. And the one type that we've got is a strain that's resistant to the antibiotic that we started with. So taking the antibiotic has huge implications for your gut. Now, let me be really, really clear. I am not saying don't take antibiotics because if you need an antibiotic, if I am faced with an awful infection, I want that antibiotic. Antibiotics have saved lives. But there's a time and a place for an antibiotic. And there's a time and a place when an antibiotic is nothing more than a placebo 
or worse, it's damaging. So we need to be careful. Now, let me, let me step across a really controversial topic. And I'm going to ask your permission to do this because I need to just say, here's the topic and here's why I'm using this to get us as a stepping stone. Since the 1950s, many um, livestock farmers have found that if they feed their livestock, swine, chickens, cattle, sheep, if they feed them very low doses of antibiotic, below the level that you would take if you had an infection, it increases the growth of the animal. Maybe five, four, six percent. Um, which may seem like a small amount, but if you have lots of livestock, that 5% is a huge difference in whether you survive or whether you, don't, whether you go under for the year. There's a lot of controversy about this. I recognize that. There's a lot of studies that say one thing and a lot of studies that say another. I'm not going down that road because that's not our purpose tonight. I'm telling you this to say there are studies in livestock that when you feed them low doses of antibiotics, they gain weight. So a group of researchers looking at microbiomes said, I wonder what the relationship is between antibiotics and weight and if it's administered through the microbiome. So they took mice and they mimicked these conditions. They gave the mice very low subtherapeutic levels of antibiotics and they had mice that had greater body fat. So while there was no difference, so this curve here that has all these different colored lines on it, this is looking at um, weight change um, over time. There's no difference in overall weight for these mice. So in this case, these mice differ from the livestock. But these mice, if you look at the text on the right-hand side, go from 22% to 32% body fat. So there's an increase in the amount of their weight that is due to fat. So this is right, so right off the bat, this is a little bit different than what's happening in livestock, and we don't understand why, but there is a higher production of body fat with, these, um, with this level of antibiotics. And there are fewer bacteria doides and more um, firmicutes. And then they can take these mice, they can either not feed them low levels of antibiotics or feed them antibiotics, and then take their microbiome and transplant that into a mouse that is germ-free, that has no microbiome. And the mouse that gets the bacteria from the gut of the mouse that's given antibiotics, so do you follow that chain through? The mouse that get the gut bacteria from a mouse that had antibiotics, those mice don't get, those mice don't get antibiotics themselves, but they gain weight because they have the gut bacterial population from the mice that were given the antibiotics. So giving them those low levels of antibiotics is changing the percentage, changing the population of bacteria in the gut, and that is contributing to this weight gain. So it looks like in livestock, it also is working through the microbiome. However, by the way, there's a great talk um, at this website down here that's on your handouts. Um, it was part of a big conference all about the microbiome. There were like 30 talks about the microbiome from leading scientists. You'll recognize a lot of the stuff if you go watch those. They're available on, um, at a YouTube channel through this group. Really, really fascinating stuff. But uh, that's what I just said. So the question then becomes, is there a relationship between obesity and use of antibiotics throughout life. So this is from the CDC's website. This is tracking states. The darker the color, the higher the percentage of obesity in those states. This is looking at the rate or the frequency of prescriptions for antibiotics across the country as well. And this is a study looking at the antibiotic use by age groups. This is for the year 2010. And you can see down in the bottom of this, this number 833, that per 1,000 people, there were 833 prescriptions written. So a little bit less than one per person. And if you look up through the age chart, you can see that in the zero to one, there were 1,300 prescriptions per 1,000 zero to one individuals. It's estimated that on average, by the time a person reaches 18, they've had somewhere between 14 and 20 rounds of antibiotics. So the question is, are these antibiotics altering the individual's microbiome? 
Again, I am not saying that they shouldn't have had those antibiotics. I don't know what the infections were. But if they're being given antibiotics because they're being brought in by mom and dad and they have a cold and mom and dad want an antibiotic to make them feel that they're doing something. All right. So here's the issue. This low dose continuous subtherapeutic dose that's given in the previous studies I just showed you, that doesn't mimic what really happens when we take antibiotics. We have short pulses of high doses of antibiotics and then time when there's no antibiotics and then short pulses again. So this same scientist, Martin Blazer, did a study with mice giving them short pulses of bacteria, uh, I'm sorry, of antibiotics. They received three to five day pulses at levels that would get them um, to, an, to an equivalent biologic dose as if you or I had had an antibiotic. They aren't giving that same amount of antibiotic to the mice, the mice are much smaller, but they're giving them this, the um, biological equivalent of that dose. Let me show you what those data, these are early data. Um, this data was presented in Dr. Blazer's talk. It hasn't yet um, shown up in a publication anywhere. So let me be very cautious and say, this comes from one source, but it hasn't come from a peer reviewed paper yet. So take that with a little grain of caution. Uh, so here you can see uh, in this, this line drawing with the boxes, uh, the mice receive their first round of antibiotics between day 10 and 15 while they're still nursing. They're weaned at day 27. They receive another round of antibiotics between day 28 and 31, another round between day 37 and 40. And then on day 41, they start a high fat diet. So recognize every child does not immediately start a high fat diet, but they're trying to mimic the diet that many individuals have that is very low fiber, very high fat. Now, what you can see is there are lots of line graphs here. Um, I'm gonna focus on the one that says weight. Uh, these colored lines are slightly higher than the dark line of the control. So you see like kind of the pink line, which is a mixture of different kinds of antibiotics. This is a very, very small increase in uh, weight, but it is an increase in weight with three, post three pulses of antibiotics. And in addition, there's a difference in lean body weight and in body weight attributed to fat, small increases. We don't yet have a good sense of what this means. And I am also not telling you to go into a pediatrician's office and slap a prescription out of a mama's hands. <laughs> All right? We don't yet fully understand this. You are seeing brand new stuff that needs to be reconfirmed in multiple populations and in human populations. These are mice. But I want to show you this because you and I have now spent four weeks talking about our microbiome and all the ways that our microbiome shifts. And I wanted you to get a sense of this as something that you need to begin paying attention to that we might see down the road. Again, I'm not telling you that if you go to the doctor and you need an antibiotic that you should not take it. But you might want to consider the possibility of probiotics. Although as Switzerland, I'm not telling you what probiotics you might want to consider. I recognize that that's not necessarily fair, but it is something for us to begin paying attention to. There may be unintended long-term consequences based on how we alter and shift our microbiome. I think the positive piece that comes from this is we are learning so much about how to tend. There's this great article from the New York Times by a guy named Carl Zimmer about our microbiome called Tending Our Microbial Garden. What an incredible image that is. Those of you that are gardeners know what that means. You amend the soil, you add a little fertilizer, you do some weeding, maybe you have to take care of some pest control. It's, I think it's gonna be that exact same concept for you and I in the very near future. That at some point soon, and I don't know if soon is five, 10, 15 years, we'll be able to assess the health of our microbiome and we'll have a whole picture of this type of microbiome is indicative of this kind of potential disorder. And these pro and prebiotics help bring us into balance. Now it's gonna take us a while to get there. It's gonna be a lot of trial and error and what works for one person is definitely not gonna work for another. But I think we're gonna move down that road, which is incredibly exciting to me that we will get, that I think we're gonna to get to something like that at some point soon. There are lots of things that still have to be done. 
lots of further research. Once we figure out what this means, there's a whole education process that has to take place for the public, for healthcare professionals. It's too soon right now to say quit taking antibiotics. I mean, there, we don't have enough. That jumps the gun until we get the further research. Can we come up with better treatments that specifically target the one bad bacteria and protect the good bacteria? And are there ways that we can replace the lost bacteria through probiotics or enhance them through prebiotics? And then we got to figure out if it's working and how we modify it. There's a lot of stuff left to do here. And again, you are, we've had the, the incredibly fun adventure of peeking into something at its beginning. We truly are at the first stages, and I know I'm keeping you late and I apologize. We truly are at the first stages of understanding the microbes that live in and on us. I can't wait to see where this goes. I want to thank you for spending four weeks with me. We've now come to the end of our time together. Um, for those of you that are online, it has been fantastic to have you. I hope that this is something that we look at, uh, that we incorporate into every Biotech 201 so that you have the option of being in your seat or watching it from an online space and expanding that out to an even broader circle. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Keith, you have something that you want to say. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's my pleasure. Drive home safely. I can't wait to see you again next year when we do 201 again. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>